Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Guys, I'm going to have to be a little quick today uh, because we have, uh, I think you know, a, a state lunch here with Prime Minister Lee. So we're going to try to get uh, done here uh, by about one if possible. Uh, and on that topic, uh, I think you probably uh, saw uh, events at the White House, but today the President is hosting Prime Minister Lee of Singapore uh, for an official visit and state dinner. It will celebrate, of course, the close and long-standing relationship between Singapore and the United States that has served as an anchor for the U.S. rebalance to Asia. Marking the 50th anniversary of diplomatic relations, the President and the Prime Minister will highlight the enduring principles that have inspired the tremendous growth in our cooperation. And, of course, as partners in the Trans-Pacific Partnership and the Counter-ISIL Coalition and the Paris Climate Agreement, the two leaders will discuss how our relationship can continue to address international challenges and advance a rules-based order in the Asia-Pacific region. And I think you know we're hosting, uh, co-hosting uh, a state lunch here uh, at the State Department in uh, just less than an hour from now. Uh, for t uh, tomorrow, the Secretary, Secretary Kerry, will host uh, the foreign ministers from uh, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Tur Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan for the second C5 plus one ministerial meeting. We welcome the Central Asian delegations to Washington and congratulate the five states as they approach their 25th anniversaries of independence. The group will be continuing the talks they began in Samarkand last November during Secretary Kerry's historic trip to Central Asia, and they will focus on issues of economic connectivity, regional security, environmental, uh, I'm sorry, environment and climate change, and of course humanitarian issues. Uh, finally, just a programming note, the Secretary will be traveling to Buenos Aires, Argentina, uh, beginning tomorrow and through Thursday. In Argentina, he will meet with Argentine President Morsorio Macri uh, to discuss cooperation on regional and global issues. He and the Foreign Minister, uh, Foreign Minister Malcora, will launch the U.S.-Argentina high-level dialogue to address pressing global challenges, including bilateral, regional, mm -hmm. multilateral, and economic issues. Uh, while there, he's also going to meet uh, with the Argentine-American Chamber of Commerce to discuss U.S.-Argentine commercial engagement and trade. There may be uh, another stop on this trip, but uh, I suspect we won't have more on that until a little bit later today. Okay. With that, Matt. Right. Uh, I don't have anything huge, but I just wanted to run. Uh, have you seen or are you aware of the um, latest comments that the Supreme Leader of Iran has made about the nuclear deal and the fact that the United States has not lived up to its end of it, end of its bar, end of its uh, uh, to its end of the deal, which is not a new complaint. But yeah. what he said that is new is basically that uh, you guys can't be trusted on anything. Now, what do you do? You make anything I, of that? I've seen the comments, um, uh, and uh, as we've said before, I'm not, we're not going to respond to every bit of rhetoric. Um, uh, out of Iran on the JCPOA. Um, that said, uh, we still assess that they're meeting their obligations under the JCPOA, uh, and we're meeting ours. Um, and it's our intention to continue to, to, to meet our obligations and our commitments under the JCPOA because we believe it's that important, because we believe um, it, it uh, can have a stabilizing influence on the region and indeed on the world. Uh, and so where the Secretary's focus is, is on, on doing just that, making sure that we stay in compliance and, of course, um, to watch as uh, Iran continues to meet it, its commitments. Okay. And then specifically on – And, uh, you know, by the way, I think you said something about not trusting us, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Again, this has never been about trust. It's been about verification and a very – strict uh, regimen of being able to, to verify uh, their compliance. So um, uh, with all due respect to the Supreme Leader's comments, uh, uh, nothing about the deal has ever been based just on trust. With all due respect toward the Supreme Leader's comments? To his comments. Not to him. To himself, his comments. To his comments on them. Um, but, but just then on, the, on that point, though, I think what he, from, from his perspective or from the Iranian perspective, it, 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 they're saying that we only negotiated on the nuclear deal, and we're not going to be involved in anything else uh, because you, you can't be trusted, as you've proven allegedly on, on the nuclear deal. And yet, you continue to the secretary continues to try to bring Iran into um, the Syria conversation, or have brought them in and continue to. So with that that will continue. You don't see any reason to stop. Well, I know of no changes in Iranian plans uh, 
uh, with respect to the International Serious Support Group. Um, uh, they, they are a member. Uh, it's our expectation that they'll remain a member and remain part of that conversation on Syria, but obviously that's a sovereign decision that they would have to make. And, I, I'm not aware of any changes. Okay. Today. And then the, the, my last one is, is more specifically toward the Iran deal itself. Have you seen the new um, calculations from um, the good ISIS, as it is known, David, David Albright's group? IS, IS. Oh, uh, no. That <clears throat> based on the based on the um, the the Iran's long term R and D, um, the document that they submitted to the IAEA, they have calculated that uh, <clears throat> unlike a calculation that, that the AP made, uh, that the breakout time after year thirteen would not be six months, but would rather be four months. Have you seen that? And if if you have, do you have any comment on what you think about it? I, I'm not seeing it, Matt. Um, uh, and uh, as far as I know, nothing has changed about our own assessments uh, and the assessments made uh, by the P5 uh, plus one uh, in the negotiations about breakout time. So I just don't have anything. More Thanks. On that. Sure. Um, there uh, is a report quoting a Syrian uh, rescue service that operates in uh, rebel held territory in Syria that a helicopter dropped containers of a toxic gas on a town close to where the Russian helicopter went down yesterday. Um, do you have any uh, clarity on what may have happened there, whether a toxic chemical was used, and if so, whether it might be a substance banned under uh, the Chemical Weapons Convention. Uh, we've seen reports as well, Arshad, and I'm not in a position to confirm the veracity of them. Obviously, um, uh, we're looking into it as best we can um, uh, with uh, uh, partners in the region. Um, and s certainly, if it's true, and again, I'm not saying it is, but if it's true, um, it would be uh, e extremely serious. Um, we've long expressed uh, our strong condemnation of the use of chemical weapons on civilians, which of course violates not only the cessation of hostilities but international standards and norms, including the Chemical Weapons Convention, to which the government of Syria is a member, and uh, two, as well as two UN Security Council resolutions, 2118 and 2209. Um, so again, not in a position to confirm. Uh, we're taking it seriously. We're looking into it, and, uh, uh, and and we'll see. Now, as you also, I think, know from. Uh, prior reports of the of the potential use of in the, uh, of, of uh, and I, I know you're not saying this was chlorine, neither am I, but you know the, the alleged use of chlorine. That the OPCW has the monitoring cap uh, the responsibility for that, and those investigations can take uh, quite some time uh, in, in, to try to actually determine what happened. But uh, obviously, it's a it's a serious report, uh, and, and we're certainly concerned about it. Chlorine, of course, is not a banned substance. It's not, but if it uh, as a substance, it's not. Uh, because it has industrial purposes, uh, but uh, if it's used as a weapon, it still uh, is considered a violation. John, could I just follow up on this? Now you're saying, if true, uh, those the, the civil defense forces or the white helmets, as uh, they are known. And uh, first of all, uh, is the United States in any way involved in training them, financing them, funding them, or anything like this? F funding who? funding th these groups. This group, the civil defense forces. I'm not aware of any. Of, you're not aware. I'm not aware of any connection. How do you? How do you? How will you know whether it is true or not? I mean, do do you well, ask the, the, again, these the, groups to submit evidence? The, it's the, as I as I said before, the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons (OPCW) has a fact-finding mission, uh, and there it's their job to investigate all credible allegations uh, of the use of chemical weapons in Syria, if the mission determines that a specific incident in Syria involved or likely involved the use of chemicals as weapons, uh, then the incident will be referred re – I'm sorry, let me, I was trying to go too fast. The incident will be referred to the OPCW-UN Joint Investigative Mechanism, which is established under Security Council Resolution 2235 to identify uh, those that were involved uh, for further investigation. So there's a process here. OPCW owns that process. The Secretary's statement yesterday. Uh, when he called on the Russians and, and, the, and the Syrians to stop uh, their offensive or bombardment and so on. And in turn, uh, the United States will also lead or call on the opposition groups to stop whatever activity they do. 
how will you influence these opposition groups? They keep, you know, morphing into something else every other day, and they, are, they, they take on different identities. How are you going to basically influence them? We have been in uh, touch with opposition uh, uh, groups from the onset, and what the secretary was referring to yesterday was his intention to to make sure that to make sure that we uh, maintain that contact uh, going forward. And I mean, he was he was referring simply to the fact that we know we have a responsibility on groups we influence. We want other nations who have influence on other opposition groups to use that appropriately as well to try to get the cessation of hostilities to actually uh, be stable and, and to be uh, and to be enforced. But the Russians too have an obligation, and he's been very clear about uh, uh, their obligations here. Not just as co-chairs of the task force, not just as uh, co-leads of the ISSG, but because they have uh, a unique relationship uh, with the regime in Syria. And finally, do you do you think that it is doable by the end of August for the talks to start, as Mr. Demstor? Well, we certainly said, hope so, Saeed. Yeah. I mean, that's really not. Uh, I, I I don't think anybody can predict it, uh, but the special envoy uh, d did suggest that um, he was going to try to get the next round started before the end of August. Um, the secretary. Um, supports that goal and that effort, um, and that's why, you know, I think back to what he said yesterday, we're, uh, we have teams that are working so hard, uh, uh, US, uh, a U.S. team and a Russia team working so hard right now to try to, uh, to get the technicalities worked out of these proposals uh, to, to better enforce the cessation of hostilities, because we both know that that was a big reason why the previous three rounds didn't work, because, uh, because the cessation was not being observed. John Turkey. Yeah. Uh, can, can you understand this? So, so really, after the, uh, you know, everyone was under the impression that after the August first, if there wasn't a transition process in place or at least talks going on, that there was going to be some kind of a change in strategy, change in in how you approach this. Clearly, that doesn't seem to be the case. Is that right? Um, I don't know. Uh, I think some people. I've seen some reporting on this that, that would suggest that there, there was some sort of gauntlet thrown down about August 1st, and that's just not the case. It was, it was not a deadline. It was a target date. It wasn't just the United States. The, the Russians also, when that date was rolled out as a target date, it was in Moscow. And the Secretary was standing next to Foreign Minister Lavrov, who also agreed that uh, the 1st of August was a good, uh, a, a, a good date to be looking at. Not just, and it, they didn't just pull it out of thin air. It was. Uh, if, you, if you look at the, 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 the timeline of the process that was codified in the UN Security Council resolution, it would lead you to say that August was the time frame when a framework for a transitioning governing body was to be established. Yeah. And now, now, wait, now I'm getting there. Hang on a second. This is all important pretext. All right. But, okay, uh, you said you want to be done by one. Well, I do. I do. I can get this. I'm, I, I can get this answer done by one. I promise you. <laughs> you said that you said that, did, that, 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 that the August one date didn't appear, appear out of this didn't come out of thin air, but it appears to have gone into thin air no, now. Not yeah, not it, it certainly all. does, John. Not it's. Not it's Matt, I mean, look, uh, we, we got for right. Okay. We have, <laughs> we have. I mean, we have the potential of a resumption of political talks here in, in August. We have two teams that are working very, very hard between the United States and, and Russia to try to uh, get some of these technicalities worked out. What the Secretary said then and what he said again yesterday was, in, in essence, our patience is not infinite. And, um, and uh, we have, in the past, thought through alternatives to this preferred diplomatic uh, approach, and we will continue as a government to continue to look at uh, alternatives and options. But. If you're asking, you know, has as of today, August 2nd, the strategy changed, the answer is no. And the Secretary still believes that the efforts that we've got these teams working on uh, are worthwhile, um, and that, as he said in Moscow a, a week or so ago, if fully implemented and in good faith, they have a real possibility of getting the cessation of hostilities to be enforceable nationwide. What's the new date, What's the new date? Any other date? I don't have a new date for you. And again, August 1st was a target. It wasn't a deadline. What's the new target? <laughs> I, I'm not going to throw out a, a, a new target. The, the, the Secretary uh, said yesterday, we're working hard on this with the Russians. Um, we're, um, we're mindful uh, of, the, uh, of the failures of the past to, to see the cessation of hostilities uh, be enforced. Um, and we're certainly mindful, as we work on this, uh, Special, Demister, Special Envoy Demister's goal 
of trying to get the talks resumed in, in the end of August. So we're going to keep working at it, and we'll see where it goes. The secretary yesterday said that um, if he said we're trying to arrive at that, that being disrupting the cycle of violence and getting the Russians to uh, re refrain from their own attacks and to restrain the Syrian government from offensive uh, actions. Then he said, quote, if we can't, nobody's going to sit around and allow this pretense to continue, close quote. What, what, did he, what did he mean by that? I think he was referring to the fact that we have seen the regime time and time again in the past say they were going to do something and not do it. We have seen time and time again in the past the Russians uh, claim that they uh, were going to use their influence on the Assad regime to bring about a certain outcome, humanitarian access, cessation violations. Uh, support to a political process, um, and there have been times where they have not uh, uh, made met their own commitments with, in that regard. So that's what he's referring to. I mean, so you're going to so you're going to drop the diplomatic pretense I, at some I'm point. Not, I, I'm not. Uh, I, again, I'm not going to engage in hypotheticals here. I think the secretary is very clear. Again, the point he was trying to make uh, is that our patience isn't infinite here for this approach that we've been trying to pursue. In a sense, doesn't have to be infinite, though. I mean, your patience can just extend for six months till the end of this administration. I, I couldn't. I'm not going to. I'm not going to predict that, uh, Arshad. And I, I, I'd rather take issue with the notion. And I'm not saying you're suggesting this, but just let me put it out there, that uh, that uh, that the work the secretary is doing uh, to try to bring peace about in Syria is. Is, is driven by the electoral calendar here in the United States. He's mindful, of course, that we have an election coming. Um, and, and he's mindful that the administration has uh, a roughly six more months uh, in office. Uh, I mean, he knows that. But, but that's not what's driving his sense of urgency to try to get something done, to try to make progress in Syria. What's driving his sense of urgency, uh, quite frankly, are reports such as what you cited today, which, again, we can't confirm, but if true, are very, very troubling. It's more and more Syrians uh, are, are being uh, killed, maimed, injured, forced to flee by their own government. And that's simply unacceptable. Is it conceivable to you that U.S. patients or that this administration's patients will run out before it leaves office? I, I, I don't honestly know the answer to that, and I don't think the Secretary knows the answer to that. I, uh, I have said before, um, and I think you could hear it in his voice yesterday, um, that he is in increasingly frustrated by the situation on the ground. But on the humanitarian corridors, you know, that uh, the U.N. saying that they ought to be under the auspices of the U.N., the Russians are saying we can, you know, we can, we can make, facilitate those human uh, in the, the U.N. Yeah, U.N., yeah. Well, I, I don't can, have anything additional have, to say. We talked about this last week. Um, uh, our, our point is we people and fighters and so on that are actually taking advantage and leaving the city. Well, those are, those are tough decisions that those individuals have to make in terms of uh, whether they're going to uh, use those humanitarian corridors to leave. We're concerned that when they do, that there's not a sufficient infrastructure to support them out there as displaced persons internally in, in, in Syria. But the point, Saeed, is, and this hasn't changed, they shouldn't have to flee. They shouldn't have to make that choice because there's already uh, requirements, uh, uh, international requirements, for the Syrian government to provide humanitarian access and support uh, to their own people. Um, uh, and and that's, that hasn't been happening, happening in a sustained, unimpeded way um, as a, the assault on Aleppo continues. Um, and if the cessation of hostilities was being observed by the regime, then there would be no need for a humanitarian corridor in the first place. Uh, and that's the other stop on the trip. Uh, well, let me wait for Elizabeth to get back. <laughs> thank, but thank you. Uh, let me go to you, and then we'll go to you. Okay. I can't keep track of so much. Just one, but one at a time, guys. Go ahead. Okay. At, at, at the Aspen meetings um, last week, over the weekend, the CIA director, John Brennan, said, quote, we're still a long way from a situation which, quote, the bulk of the people, and he's referring to Iraq and Syria, view their country as representative. Would you agree or disagree with that statement, that characterization? If you disagree, why would why do you disagree with the CIA view? That sounds like a question from my history exam in college. <laughs> if is, not, is it, why not? Listen, I I I'm, I'm going to let the I, I, I'm going to let the director uh, speak for his knowledge of, of views. I'm not a pollster. I don't. I, I I couldn't possibly speak with any expertise about the uh, the, the opinions of 
the majority of Iraqi citizens. This is what I can speak to, and this is what I do know, that we continue to support Prime Minister Abadi as he continues to work through political reforms uh, and to try to form a, a more inclusive, more effective, more efficient government in, in Iraq. All, by the way, fighting uh, a major presence inside his own borders of uh, of uh, a terrorist group, Daesh. Uh, so uh, there, there's an awful lot on, on his plate. There's an awful lot on the plate uh, of the Iraqi government. We're going to continue to support them uh, as they continue to work through these, these issues. And he has made progress. There is no question when you look at Iraqi security forces that they are more inclusive, that their battlefield competence is rising in many ways because we're helping with that mission on the ground, um, and that they have been effective. Um, uh, on the ground against Daesh uh, in many places uh, throughout uh, Iraq, Fallujah, Tikrit. I mean, uh, you could go on and on, uh, Beji. So um, we're committed to this effort alongside our Iraqi partners, and, um, and we're going to do everything uh, that we do in Iraq with their consultation, with their permission, with their support, you know, uh, uh, going forward. Does the U.S. view the legacy of sectarianism from the Maliki government something that it ha has to help the uh, Abadi government deal with uh, to to encourage them and and sh help them help Abadi deal with that sec legacy of sectarianism? Uh, look, certainly we've talked about this. That uh, uh, one of the reasons that we believe uh, Daesh was able to be so effective uh, two years ago, uh, uh, rolling through uh, Mosul, was they was they went up against uh, Iraqi security forces that had not been properly maintained in leadership, in resources, in training, in equipment, um, and uh, an, an Iraqi security force that that Prime Minister Maliki paid little heed to when it came to making it more pluralistic and non-sectarian and inclusive. And so when Prime Minister Abadi uh, came into office, I mean, he knew that that was a problem he was inheriting, and he has made strides to try to improve that. Um, and we've seen it uh, on the ground. We've seen it in Baghdad. We're going to continue to support him as he works through that. Uh, but look, nobody also ever expected the challenges facing him to be solved overnight. Again, he's trying to do anything that you take take Dash out of the picture, and the tasks before him are still daunting. Uh, there, I mean, given what he inherited um, and, um, and the turmoil that Iraq has gone through for so long. Um, then you add Dash into the picture and you can see that um, uh, there's an awful lot of work that still needs to be done, and we're mindful of that. We are, we're committed to standing with him as he does that, as he works through that. Yeah, sure. Uh, not so long ago, commander of U.S. forces in Africa at his confirmation hearing, Thomas Walderhaus, said that he did not know what the overall uh, strategy in Libya was. What is the overall uh, strategy in Libya? It appears that with the Libyan government not being able to fight terrorists on its own, the U.S. will be there for a long time. What is the U.S. doing not to be there for a long time? Well, let me challenge a couple of the notions in your question. but. I'll do it this way. The, the strategy in Libya continues to be to support um, the government of national accord and, a, and the political process that Prime Minister al-Sharaj is trying to put in place um, to, to, again, form uh, an effective unity government. Um, and we continue to believe that the best path forward for the Libyan people is a political path um, and political solutions. Um, and our support to the Prime Minister uh, remains steadfast and, and sure. Um, the strikes that you're talking about in the last couple of days, and they were air strikes. Uh, uh, there was no U.S. Uh, footprint, footprint on the ground here. Uh, they were air strikes, and they were done at the specific request of the Prime Minister and the Government of National Accord to, to go after Daesh targets inside Libya. Overall strategy is to, to support the, the GNA, the GNA moving Correct. forward. Well, the GNA uh, has been having a very difficult time unifying the country. There's this parallel government in Tobruk, and just a few days ago, the parliament in Tobruk refused to vote, um, refused to hold the vote of confidence in, in the GNA. So at a time when the GNA is having a difficult time unifying the country, do you think UN backing and now U.S. military support could give a green light to, to give a sort of a signal to the GNA to crack down on parts of the country.
And uh, uh, this is a political solution that we're seeking, not a military one. But the President has been clear, President Obama has been clear, that, uh, that where and when uh, we're able to degrade and defeat Daesh, we're going to do it. Um, now, these strikes were done at the specific request of the GNA, and I suspect you'll see that kind of communication uh, and consultation going forward. It wasn't the first time that we did strikes against Daesh targets in, in Libya, um, and it may not be the last. Is the U.S. arming or planning to arm uh, forces under the control of the GNA? I'm not aware of any such plans. Uh, what about U.S. Ground, ground troops? Uh, are there plans to deploy troops you in to Libya to, to fight the, against ISIS? You have to talk to the Defense Department, but I'm aware of no such plans. Again, we're seeking political solutions in Libya. This is a, this is a, the, the strikes you saw yesterday were very much in keeping with the, the same approach that we've taken in Iraq and that we have tried to take in Syria, which is supporting ground forces, indigenous ground forces, to fight against Daesh. So I'm not aware of any uh, change in, in those plans at all from a military perspective, and no, not aware of any effort or desire or intent uh, to put U.S. forces in, in a combat role on the ground in, in Libya. This is about supporting indigenous ground forces, as we've done elsewhere. Quick so follow. <clears throat> they claim that you are acting illegally. The, 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 the Russians. The, well, I've seen the claim. It's, mm -hmm. it's just false. It was a legal authority to do this, uh, uh, you know, in, in terms of our counterterrorism role. And again, I would remind you, Saeed, it was a specific request by the, the GNA and Prime Minister Al Shiraj to conduct these strikes. Yeah. Turkey, um, President Erdogan is now saying that uh, Turkey's friends are standing with terrorists and coup plotters. His government has now, it says, submitted a second document to the United States explaining why uh, Gula needs to be immediately arrested. And there's a delegation of Turkish lawmakers in town visiting Justice DHS and over here. I'm wondering if um, you've got anything uh, to respond to these comments, especially about that uh, if uh, essentially they're saying if the United States doesn't hand over Gula and then the United States is supporting terrorists and coup plotters, and it could endanger the strategic alliance. Oh, well, okay. I think, again, we very strongly condemn the failed coup. Um, uh, we've strongly rejected any attempt to overthrow democracy in, in Turkey, um, and we support, as we've said from the very beginning, the democratically elected government there. Um, Turkey remains a NATO ally. They remain a key partner. Uh, in the coalition to defeat Daesh. I think you saw that General Dunford, the Joint Chiefs Chairman, was just recently there, had good constructive meetings, and, uh, and came out uh, of those meetings uh, and publicly commented about the, 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 the positive tone uh, of those discussions. Insulik remains open uh, to, uh, to, to U.S. aircraft to conduct uh, strikes against uh, Daesh in, in Syria, uh, and we look for that cooperation to, to continue. Uh, we're mindful that, uh, that this was a serious coup attempt and that Turkey um, has put in place measures to, to investigate and to try to uh, bring those uh, responsible uh, to account. All along, from the very beginning, we've also uh, urged and encouraged our friend Turkey, as they do this, to observe rule of law uh, and, uh, and to preserve um, uh, confidence in their own democratic institutions. And, and we're going you know, to stay committed to that partnership uh, going forward. Um, so I, I, I've seen Lots of comments out there. Uh, and again, uh, just like before, I'm not going to respond to every bit of rhetoric. Uh, <coughs> but uh, but uh, again, I can assure you that Turkey has no better friend than the United States. We want to see uh, 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 Turkey uh, emerge from this uh, strong and democratic uh, and sure-footed. Well, you mentioned, you mentioned uh, General Dunford's visit and his comments and his message to the Turkish officials that he spoke yeah. with. And you talked about how he spoke of a positive tone of these discussions. And yet, less than a day afterwards, the president of the country, not the joint chief, not the Turkish Joint Chiefs Chairman, not the Turkish Prime Minister, but the president of the country, the commander in chief, makes these comments. Does that not dishearten you at all? I mean, is this message, this message that you guys are trying to send, doesn't seem to be getting through? Isn't well, that yeah, isn't, isn't, isn't that a problem? I, I can't speak for. Uh, President Erdogan or, or his comments, uh, I can only speak for, for I can only speak for us. I know. And, Aren't you? And, and my so my question is, what, what, what 
are you not does this not dishearten you does it not make you uh, annoy you or bother you that your good friend allied dem democratically elected president erdogan uh, that your send your joint chiefs as chairman of your joint chiefs of staff over there to make nice with his people and to explain your position and yet the next day he comes out and trashes you again well look, that's not a problem matt what matters is uh the, the partnership in, that we have with turkey going forward and certainly in the practical tangible ways that partnership can be realized such as going after Daesh in Syria and the support that we continue to get from, from Turkey in that regard. Um, uh, President Erdogan, um, uh, as the sovereign head of state uh, of, of the government of, of Turkey, is certainly free to express his views and his frustrations as he sees fit. We respect his right to do that. We've also been open and honest that, you know, even, even before the coup, we didn't agree with Turkey on everything. Um, so we're going to we're going to stay committed to having the dialogue and uh, going forward, and that dialogue is happening. I mean, our ambassador John Bass is uh, is still working hard every day in Ankara to to reach out to his counterparts and to talk about these developments as they go forward. Do you know anything about the second document that was mentioned that the Turks have talked no, about? No, I had not heard about a, a second document. And again, I'd refer you to Justice Department on all questions about extradition. So President Erdogan is going to Moscow uh, in one week. Do you read anything in this visit? Uh, you'd have to talk to President Erdogan about his travel habits and his plans. I, 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 I don't know. I mean, again, sovereign heads of state are, uh, uh, have every right and responsibility to, to conduct bilateral relations as they see fit. One, one more of this, if I may. Um, sure. Uh, President Erdogan is quoted, at least in our story, as saying, um, I'm calling on the United States. What kind of strategic partners are we that you can still host someone whose extradition I have asked for, close quote. Um, do you regard the uh, what you are aware of as so far having been transmitted by the Turks? I'm not asking about the second batch, if there was a second document. Um, do you regard that as an extradition request? As I understand it, and now I'm getting into uh, an area really that uh, that it's not for the State Department to comment on, so I'm going to obviously refer you to justice. But as I understand it, um, they are in receipt of documents. I do not know how many. I do not know in, in, in what number of batches they've come in, um, nor do I know the content. As, as I understand it, they are still analyzing those documents, and I don't believe that a, a judgment is made one way or the other yet in terms of whether it's formal extradition. I, I do want to make two points there. Right. Yep. Yes. A uh, uh, couple of points. It can be, as I said before, a lengthy legal process, the, the task of, of, of extradition. And as you know, we don't typically make it a, a habit of speaking to specific cases. Now, this one was obviously unique given the circumstances. It was unavoidable that we would, uh, that we would have to address it um, given the, uh, uh, the, the very public calls for it by the government of Turkey. So we have, we have had to do that. But I don't want to set an expectation up. Um, that we're going to be able to give you a blow-by-blow blow of the process as it works its way through. Well, except that they keep <laughs> yelling about it and talking about it in public, and if that forced you to talk about it the first time, I think it, you know, you're going to have to, you're going to keep getting the question whether you're prepared to answer it or not. <laughs> no, Anyone else? Is... Look, I know I'm going to get continue to get the question, but again, it's a process that we, we're going to try to preserve the, the sanctity of it, and while I understand that um, that is going to keep coming up here. I just want to set the expectations as low as possible uh, that I'm going to be able to provide a very uh, a detailed uh, rundown every single day uh, of the progress of it. Succeeded. Very quick question. Yeah, you're going to have to be real quick. Very quick. quick. Uh, today also President Erdogan said there has not been a single Western official visited me after General Danford. Uh, I, I was wondering if you have any uh, visitors going to Turkey from U U.S. government in time. I sure. don't have any other uh, travel to speak to other than the, the chairman's uh, trip. Uh, uh, second very quick question is that uh, it has been almost three weeks since the coup attempt, and you said that uh, you you want to Turkey to observe the rule of law. Do you think so far Turkey's action uh, is well, I, I, I've also said I'm not going to characterize every action that they take. I'm not going to start doing that today. We, our ambassador, John Bass, is, is working very closely with his uh, counterparts in, in Ankara, talking through what the developments are and the decisions that, that the government 
uh, is making. Uh, and I'm going to leave it there for today. Uh, I do have uh, Matt was right, and I can now. Oh. I can now. Okay. I know. I, I mean, want to put that on a loop. Absolutely. <laughs> and, I think, and have it play continually. I'm going to have a cake tonight in your honor because you know, <laughs> for you to be right, but. Uh, the, the president did announce today that the, uh, the designation of a presidential delegation to attend the opening ceremony of the 2016 Olympic Summer Games in Rio, uh, the, uh, that the opening ceremonies will be held on the 5th of August. The delegation uh, will attend athletic events, meet with U.S. athletes, and attend the opening ceremony. The secretary will be uh, leading that delegation, uh, and then the White House put out a list of the rest of the delegation members. I'll refer you to uh, their press release on that. Uh, and with that, have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.